Well, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we're turning our Bibles this morning. And Well, remember where we are, right? We are, we're going through and we're working our way through the book of 1 Peter. We've spent a couple of weeks as our final uh, morning here looking at uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. And we've been uh, here in the, in the book of 1 Peter. And, and remember what the book of 1 Peter is all about. And so, a reminder, uh, 1 Peter is about how do I keep Christ in the center of of my life. More specifically, how do I keep Christ in the center of my life amidst suffering? When, when I'm in a trial, when there's difficulties, when there are hardships, suffering is going on in my life, around me, how am I supposed to keep Jesus in the center of my life then? Where do I turn? In a, for, for us, in a, in a busy busy, busy world that we live. How is Christ to be central in our lives in a world that is all about, I, I need, I need, I want, I want, I need to get this. How is Jesus to be central amid suffering in your life? That's what the aim of First Peter is to believers. It is written to Christians, it is written to believers to, to draw us to him so that he is first. It is, is making sure that our, our, our loves are in the proper order. We've been here, as I said, in chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 for the last little bit. And this morning, uh, what we see as we come to the final bit of this section, we, we've seen so far that that. Christ is to be central. He's the cornerstone. And Jesus is either your cornerstone or he is your stumbling block. He's your cornerstone or he is your stumbling block. And he, if, he is, if he is your cornerstone, what that means for us is, is that God is building his church. And if God is building his church, it means that, that he is using you. You are an important part of the church, and he is using you to, as part of the church, building that for his glory. Beautiful. Peter wants to encourage us to keep growing in him, to to follow him, to obey him. He wants you to not lose heart in the midst of, of, of difficulties. Don't lose heart. God loves you. His mercy has been poured out on you. Now, even as I say that, I realize that perhaps you are having a hard time accepting the fact that you really are loved by God, that his mercy is for you, been poured out on you. Maybe you struggle with that. That whole idea. Maybe you even struggle whether to know you are a believer or not. Are you a Christian? Do you know that? Well, God doesn't want you to stay there, and he's given us his word. And and so I love this passage. I love how this passage speaks to us because God wants you to know that you are his. Uh, If, in fact, you are, he wants you to know that you are his. Why don't uh, I read this passage for us, and then I will pray and ask God to guide us. Follow along with me, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll I'll pick it up here in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, and we'll read through to verse 10. Here's what it says. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that you may grow up into your salvation. If you have tasted it, the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, 
to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. See? I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word this morning, I ask that you will illuminate that word. You, in other words, Lord, help us to, to understand what you are saying to us. Lord, help those who are doubting. Lord, make it clear. I pray that you will speak to those who are hurting, to the suffering, to, to the fearful, Lord, to the rebellious, I, I pray that you will speak and that we will hear you and we will follow you. God, guide my words. Lord, we need you. And we turn to you and thank you for your word. So guide in Jesus. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It was A.W. Tozer that said something to the effect of, what you think about God is the most important thing that you think about. What you think about God is the most important thing that you think about. What do you think about God? What comes to your mind? Uh, there's a number of things that may come to mind, but I would fully agree with Tozer in that how you think about God and, and what God thinks about you, what you think about that is, is of utmost importance. It is going to drive, uh, it's going to affect the decisions that you make, all the choices that you make, it is going to affect all of that. We have a tendency to maybe get um, God out of perspective when we, uh, when we either just focus on one thing out of the Bible, or we ignore the Bible and create our own thing. What do you think about God? We want to know what God has said through his word so we can understand him and know him. And, and so there's a couple of ideas of things that maybe how you maybe think of God. I, I know some or churches even will, will tend to focus on the fact that God is an angry God. He's angry He's just waiting for you to step out of line. And as soon as you do, he's, he's, he's on you. <laughs> Angry. Um, is that how you view God? Churches will emphasize fire and brimstone kind of God, right? There isn't a place for the anger of God and the justice of God. But if that is where you swing your pendulum and that's the focus... Um, what is that going to do to how you think about God and what you're going to do? You, you will live in an unhealthy fear. You will be driven by a, uh, a God who is, is, is just wrathful and waiting for you to step out of line. Not much joy in that, is there? On the other end, you can swing the pendulum to the other side, and you may picture God, and this is very popular today, is God is a God of love, which he is, but only love. That's all that is ever thought of. God's love. God is, uh, he, he is so loving. He uh, is full of joy, and, and he is a God of love, and we get that a lot. 
what, what tends to happen when we think of God as only love, though, is we begin to create a God that is not a God of the Bible. It is our own God, the God that we want. A God that uh, says, uh, looks a little bit like a, a very Santa Claus-like God. God will get me what I want. Maybe another way to put it is, God, he's got my back. And if you hear that and, and, that, and you think in that terms, you, you will tend to approach God and think of God as when he's got your back, he, he is there for me to do what, what I want him to do. Santa Claus. He's jolly. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's neat. Yes, he watches me, but uh, he gets me what I want. Perhaps you maybe think of God, when you think of God, he's um, practically, you think he's very distant. He's, he's distant. He is a little bit aloof. Uh, he's really, really busy. I mean, God's a, he's got a lot going on. Uh, the whole universe and all the things going on in the world, and he's very busy. And so he really doesn't have time for your particular issues. So you'd rather not bother him unless it's really important. And then hopefully he'll lend an ear, can can throw a little extra grace your direction. He's distant. What do you think about God? Maybe one more. Depending upon how you think of God, you, you maybe will think of God in a sense of the fact that when you think of what, what does God think about you? Maybe what comes to mind is that he is disappointed in you. When he thinks of you, he's disappointed. He is um, ashamed of you. Maybe even a little disgusted. I mean, he knows all of it, so... Certainly he's disgusted. No, I, I know, you know that God is a God of love and joy and, and for, for others, but for you, not a chance. Truth be told, my guess is that for many of us, that's where we think of what God thinks about us. Disappointed. we can get out of balance in our understanding of who God is and how he thinks about us. But what you think about God is the most important thing that you think about and what he thinks about you. It drives what you do. It affects your behaviors. It affects uh, your, your thoughts for others. What I want to do this morning out of this text, this is the final time that we're here in verses 4 through 10, more specifically we'll be in verses 6 through 10, but, but this, what we're going to see is how marvelous of a salvation that he has given to us as Christ followers. Here's what this passage does for me, and I hope it does this for you. For me, this passage is a gift to help me fight doubt. It is, is a gift, this passage is a gift for me to overcome condemnation, and more specifically, self-condemnation. This is, a, this is a passage to help to know more of God and His kindness toward me, a sinner. I'm in need of Him. This puts my eyes on Jesus and not so much on on myself. I have my eyes on me a lot and I need my eyes more on Christ and this passage does that for me. It becomes my motivation to walk in Him and to trust Him. One of the other things it does for me is this passage uh, gives me a greater heart for evangelism, to, to make Him known to those who don't know him, who don't believe in him. Um, I hope this will do the same for you. Look again at verse 6. 
For it stands in Scripture, and then he's going to refer to Isaiah chapter 28. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone. And the one who believes in him, who's the him? Jesus, right? Will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe. So Peter is going to give a contrast between the believer and the unbeliever, a Christian and a non-Christian. He's going to give a contrast between the two, and, uh, and what you decide and what you believe regarding who Christ is, whether you believe or unbelief, is going to make a difference of an eternity for you. You will either believe in him or you will reject him as we'll see here. And this is the contrast. So Peter's writing to believers, he's writing to Christians, and he's saying, this is, what you, this is what you, who you are and where you have been, and this is a believer versus an unbeliever, and here's the differences, and this is what difference that makes. Notice, the one who believes in him, the one who believes in Christ, the cornerstone, will never be put to shame. You will never, you won't be humiliated before God. You won't be put to shame. And there is honor. He will honor you who come to Him. To those of you who believe, there is no shame and there is honor. And then the opposite. The one who rejects Jesus. The one who refuses to believe. The one who refuses to believe in Jesus. Here's what it says, verse 7. So honor will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, and a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because... They disobey the word. They were destined for this. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. These are ones who disobey the word. They disbelieve God. They, the unbeliever rejects Jesus and his words. Um, now, Typically, you, most people, they, they don't say that they reject Jesus. Uh, they just, they'll say, no, I really like Jesus. I, I love Jesus. I like him a lot. But truth be told, they don't like all that he has to say. They, they reject his words. They disobey the word. They, they have disbelief in what Jesus says. In other words, they hear what he says and they reject it. They find his teaching revolting. Here's the heart posture of an unbeliever. What does an unbeliever, unbelieving heart look like? The unbeliever says, you, you say that I have to submit to your ways? <clears throat> well, I know better what's best for me in my life. I'm not going to submit. You have no right over me. You have no right over me. I know what's best for my life. I'll do what I want, how I want, and when I want. Now, the the unbeliever may very well communicate that in a very nice way way. They'll be very nice about it. Very kind. Oh, that's not for me, thank you. I, I really like Jesus. Just, I, I don't agree with everything. Um, I don't agree with everything that God has said. I, he really doesn't have a right to tell me how to live. I'm not going to submit to his way. So I can be a very nice person But that is the very heart posture is very clear. Defiance. Rebellion. It's the very heart posture. They stumble because they disobey the word. They 
they have no intentions of actually obeying all that God has said. I'll pick and choose, I hear that, but to actually submit to his will and his way, no thank you. It's defiance, rebellion. Now, before we start going and pointing fingers to those out there, this is also the very nature of every single one of us. Our very nature that we were born into, our hardwired, everyone has this posture from the moment of conception to do what we want, when we want, how we want it. I want my way. Gosh, are we really that bad? <laughs> Keep your finger here in 1 Peter and turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, chapter 1, says this, And you... We're dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in, dis in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead. Spiritually dead. In which we lived according to the ways of the world, according to the satanic powers. We lived in disobedience. We were previously lived in our fleshly desires, carrying out our will. When it do things our way. It's our very nature as children of wrath. If that's not enough, listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. Our very nature, our very heart posture has been in this. To do what we want, how I want. I want my own kingdom. I want to, I don't have to, to, to live according to the way God tells me. I want to live the way I want. I know what's best. And, and I'm really not all that bad. I'm a generally, I'm a pretty good person. We make a defense. We, we have a, uh, an inner lawyer that that lawyer tries to make a defense to declare ourselves good. I'm not all that bad. Especially in comparison to some of those out there. Pretty good person. I mean, I've never murdered anybody, right? Let me try to help. Imagine the scene. You're in a courtroom. And in that courtroom is a witness stand, and actually you are called to that witness stand because you have to give an account for how good you are. So the accuser stands up and comes and stands before you and says, uh, I wanted to recognize just a, a number of things here. 
And he begins to expound and, and, and share, tell of your sins. Uh, you've been disobedient to your parents. You have um, finagled and lied. You've, you've lied to your small group leader. <laughs> you have... You have been drunk. You've been gambling. You have have flown off the handle. You've been unkind. You've been mean-spirited. You've punished others. And and so you, you have this immediate... Lawyer-like defense to say, well, hold, hold, hold on. Okay, well, I'm not that bad. Like I said, I, I've never murdered anybody. I, I, there's a lot worse out there. And then the accuser says, oh, dear, dear sinner, I, I've only begun to talk about the external sins. We have not yet begun to talk about the things that you have done in private, let alone the things that you have have gone on in your very heart, your very thoughts. Each and every one of us, each and every one of us are sin-stained. Ephesians says, dead in our sins. We inhaled rejection of God and exhaled our, our, our own self-will and demands. We can do that very nicely, be very good people. But this says they disobey the word. They, they refuse to do as he says. The unbeliever, the very nature of the heart. As many of you know, one of my favorite books, Gentle and Lowly, goes on to explain our heart nature this way. Sin was not something we lapsed into. It defined our moment-by-moment existence at the level of deed, word, thought, and yes, even desire. We not only lived in sin, we enjoyed living in sin. We wanted to live in sin. It was our coddled treasure, our golem's ring, our settled delight. In short, we were dead, utterly helpless. And and herein lies the difference between the believer and the unbeliever, the the Christian and the unchristian, the non-Christian. One has been given a gift of knowing their desperate need of a Savior, of salvation, of forgiveness. One has been given a gift of knowing that they are desperate sinners in need of forgiveness from a holy God. That's the Christian. Where the unbeliever has no desire to follow the Lord in their hearts. They they may, in fact, go to church. They they may go to church. They may do do their part They may give, they may engage, they may look really good. But at the end of the day, they're convinced that it's something within themselves that God will accept them because of something within them. They're not that bad. And inwardly, They disobey and reject the words of God. And 
Encouraged? Aren't you so glad you came so far? (laughs) Unless you grasp how desperate you need forgiveness, unless you realize how badly you need a Savior, the rest of the story will make little difference. Because but God, God is in complete control. They stumble, verse 8, because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. God is in complete control. There is nothing that happens. There is not one person that falls out of God's will, out of God's sovereign hand. He knows those who are his. And he is in complete control, and he will pour out his mercy upon those whom he rescues. He pours out his mercy. Peter is reminding believers where they have come from. From a hardened, dead soul. And he describes what God has done for you now. Look at verse 9. But you, you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now, You are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. But you, he he called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see what he's done for you, believer? He's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were this, you were not his people, but now. And so if you mark in your Bibles, which I always encourage you to do, you want to underline and and bold underline now. Present tense, now. It's, It's happening now and into, it's ongoing now. But now you are God's people. You had not received mercy But now you have received mercy. Do do you hear the promise of the God who delivers on his promises? Now you have received mercy. You've received it. It's yours. Present state. His mercy is for you right now. You've received his mercy. God is rich in mercy. That's what Ephesians 2, 4 says. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Mercy. Mercy means that he has seen your stubborn, rebellious condition. He knows your hell-bent heart. And he has smothered you with his kindness and his compassion. It's mercy. What do you think about God? For what you think about God and and what you think that God thinks about when he thinks of you are the most important things that you can think about. It affects everything. What do you think about God? God's judgment for the rebellious sinner is just. And his poured out love for you is merciful. The 
this passage tells me that, that God isn't distant. He's, he's not distant. He knows that I had no way within myself, no right within myself. I, I could not get mercy from within. I needed mercy from without. You, you cannot find mercy and forgiveness from within. No matter how good you are, it comes from without. You know what this passage tells me? It tells me that he doesn't meet us halfway. You do your half, he'll do his half. We were dead. There is no possibility. And he pours out his mercy. His very heart gushes mercy now. Now. What what does mercy look like? You, You know what it looks like? It's Jesus. It's mercy. This tells me, this passage tells me that we can come to him. It's verse 4. And he wants us to come to him always. Always. Turn to him. Come to him. It's his mercy. Let me read a portion of Gentle and Lowly again on this very topic of mercy. Listen, the author says, perhaps looking at the evidence of your life, you don't know what to conclude except that this mercy of God in Christ has passed you up. Maybe you have been deeply mistreated misunderstood, betrayed by the one person you should have been able to trust, abandoned, taken advantage of. Perhaps you carry a pain that will never heal till you are dead. If my life is any evidence of the mercy of God in Christ, you might think, I'm not impressed. To you, I say, the evidence of Christ's mercy toward you is not your life. The evidence of his mercy toward you is his. Mistreated, misunderstood, betrayed, abandoned, eternally in your place. If God sent his own son to walk through the valley of condemnation, rejection, and hell, you can trust him that you walk through your own valleys on your way to heaven. Perhaps you have difficulty receiving the rich mercy of God in Christ, not because of what others have done to you, but because of what you have done to torpedo your life. Maybe through one big stupid decision, or maybe through 10,000 little ones. You have squandered his mercy, and you know it. To you, I say, do you know what Jesus does with those who squander his mercy? He pours out more mercy. God is rich in mercy. That's the whole point. Whether we have been sinned against or have sinned ourselves into misery, the Bible says God is not tight-fisted with mercy but open-handed. Not frugal but lavish. Not poor but rich. And Listen to this. It means the very things about you that make you cringe most make him hug hardest. It means his mercy is not calculating and cautious like ours. It is unrestrained, flood-like, sweeping, generous. It means our haunting shame is not a problem for him, but the very thing he loves most to work with. It means our sins 
do not cause his love to take a hit. Our sins cause his love to surge forward all the more. It means on that day when we stand before him quietly, unhurriedly, we will weep with relief, shocked at how impoverished a view of his mercy-rich heart we had. He called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What do you think about God? For what you think about God and what you think that he thinks about you are some of the most important things that you think about. What do you think about when you think of God? This is God who is rich in mercy. Let's pray. Lord, you are rich in mercy. It is your very heart. You, you pour out mercy. It is, the, it is the gospel. Jesus saves sinners. Lord, I ask that those who do not know you would, would turn their hearts to you, that you would awaken them, make them alive in you. Lord, help them to see that they are in fact stained with sin and unable to cleanse themselves. They have been disobedient and rebellious. Give them a gift, Lord, to, to, to awaken them to that and may they turn to you. For your mercy is more. Your mercy is more. You give more mercy. You give greater grace. It is your very, your very nature. Lord, for the, the saint here, the the sinner who has believed in you, I, I pray that you would encourage us. Give us backbone, Lord, to, to walk in you, to stand in you, to stand amidst a storm. Not alone, but because you are with us. For your mercy is more. You give greater grace. We are a people that turn to you and turn our eyes to you. For your mercy is more. Thank you.